Hello, everybody. I, I'm glad to, uh, to take the time to talk about a really exciting opportunity that Maine Historical Society has uh, officially started this July with a $341,000 Humanities and Collections Resources Grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, this project aims to digitize, provide full text access, to contextualize and build tools on the main memory network for three of MHS's most uh, significant, or three of our most significant collections, which include the Pajevskop proprietors, the Kennebec proprietors, and the Barclay collection. So these three collections represent um, something that is of significant research value to Maine Historical Society, and that's records about land distribution, land use, and the misappropriation of land, and the drawing of the Northeast boundary. So it's really about uh, defining the Maine identity, and it's distinct from Massachusetts, it's distinct from British colonial rule, and from the federal government after statehood, but really understanding what Maine means in the national and international narrative. So these three collections were chosen for this particular grant um, for uh, several reasons. One would be their relationship to Maine, uh, U.S., and international history. Uh, the, another would be because they're uh, frequently consulted and heavily used in, in person, some of the documents dating back to the 1620s, uh, for preservation reasons, uh, for their relationship to the path to Maine statehood, because of the unique nature of their content, including the critical time of first contact between European settlers and the Wabanaki and indigenous communities in, in what is now known as Maine, and um, because of uh, the popularity with the research community. For two of the collections, uh, the third collection, the Barclay collection, which I'll talk a little bit uh, about in a moment, is uh, underutilized and really a hidden gem at Maine Historical Society. So we were able to take two of our most heavily consulted collections and a collection that we feel should really be getting more limelight than it does and bringing those together in this really robust project. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the three collections and what we're planning on doing as part of this grant. So this, uh, these are highly competitive grants. This was the third time we had applied for this particular uh, proposal. And I think really the last, this last time our, our proposal was extremely strong because it garnished support from the uh, Passamaquoddy and Penobscot communities and demonstrating the uh, significant relationship with those communities that can be found in these collections, especially when it comes to uh, the acquisition of land in what is colonial Maine. So the first collection that we'll be working on as part of this project is uh, the Pajebscot proprietors. So the Pajebscot proprietors are also known as the proprietors of the township of Brunswick or the Pajebscot company or the Pajebscot purchase company. It's essentially it's a land holding company out of Massachusetts that was incorporated in 1714. So the records themselves date from about 1627 through 1866, but the company itself uh, operated between 1714 and 1814, just about 100 years. But a lot of their records predate that because they're acquiring titles from um, your other European settlers, from landholders, from grant holders, and from Wabanaki communities. And these, this collection documents those, the, the gathering and consolidating of those holdings, the distribution of those holdings, so selling those to other speculators, selling those to individuals to encourage settlement, and, uh, and reselling those to other individuals to encourage settlement, which causes a lot of controversy and uh, a lot of complexity with their competitor, one of which is the Kennebec proprietors. So we have here as an example of the map of Situate, which is an early name for Brunswick um, in the 1730s. And this is an example. The Pajepska Proprietors is the smallest of the three collections that we're digitizing, but it is the most heavily used. It is hands down the most heavily used collection at Maine Historical Society. The Kennebec Proprietors is the second most used collection, and the Pajebscot is paged twice as much. So this collection is consulted on a weekly basis. 
at Maine Historical. And like I mentioned, some of the documents date back to the 1630s, uh, in which the, the frequency with their page is a real preservation concern. But despite its popularity, more than 90% of this collection does not exist online. And part of the complexity with that is the nature of the holdings themselves. Some of the maps are too large for us to digitize with the technology we've had available to us. Some of the materials are still bound. And the nature of these early papers are really inconsistent sizing and shaping, which makes digitization more lengthy and more complicated. Plus the, the nature of the documents and our ability to present those in a cohesive way and to contextualize those so that someone can look at a bound volume and can, or look at a previously bound volume and can browse through it in the same way that they can when they're in the reading room is something that main memory has yet to, is technology main memory has yet to attain. And that is part of this grant is to introduce those discovery tools and those uh, that user interface that's really going to allow an individual to view this collection as a collection, not at the item level nature of what um, main memory is at present. A lot of the maps are on main memory, but there are 88 maps in the collection. I'd say maybe about a third of them are already online, including this one. Again, the size and the scope of the materials has been a bit problematic. This NEH grant um, has uh, built our technology in a way that allows us to do more in-house, but we're also partnering with Osher Map Library when they'll be digitizing some of the more complex materials that we um, are, are unable to do ourselves. So that partnership is really a great opportunity for us to be able to, um, to collaborate with another organization, especially on something that is so meaningful to their repository as well. This is an example of a deposition, which is a lot of the materials that you'll find in the collection. This is from Pierre Pohl. It was an Abenaki um, uh, native, and this is a dep deposition that he's giving about um, the names for the locations around the Androscoggin River. So just in their name, the, the, proprietor, the Pajebska proprietors, the proprietors of the township of Brunswick focused on the Brunswick area, but they branch out into what like, I'll call like the lower mid coast, uh, Brunswick, top some Harpswell, and then inland in what historically is known as uh, Bakerstown, which is Minot, Poland, um, parts of Lewiston, parts of Auburn, New Gloucester, that sort of area is, is historically known as Bakerstown. And so these are the areas where the Pajebska proprietors are, are largely working. And they were really encouraging settlement because if you could get someone to move there and to establish roots there and then to set up uh, schools, to set up a town, to set up churches, then it would encourage more settlement, which would drive the prices up. So at the end of the day, this is really, a, this is an economic, this is a business for these individuals. So you'll, that's the nature of these materials, is the business. And then here I have another deposition, which is from two brothers that is talking about um, the, the landmarking. So it's very difficult. They would send out surveyors and trying to gauge what the boundaries are of these lands, the land that they were selling, the land that they're abutting up next to it. So it's a lot of conversation and description of the land, coupled with the, um, the, the deeds and the exchanges from the Wabanaki community who didn't see this as a transfer of ownership, but saw this as an opportunity to cohabitate and to live together. So the, um, the, the language and the understanding and the relationships with these individuals is, 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 uh, is tense. On top of, you know, you've got squatters, you're selling the same piece of land to another individual. So there's a lot of tension. And all of this is happening during the colonial wars. All of this is happening during what is known as Dummer's War and King William's War and, and these. So you're seeing people fleeing from these areas, heading down to Massachusetts, coming back and trying to reclaim land without the proper paperwork, et cetera. So it's, um, it's very tense. So the Pajepska proprietors had a major competitor. There were several proprietor organizations operating in Maine during the colonial period, during the period that, that Maine was the District of Massachusetts. But the Kennebec and the Pajepska are two of the largest um, and two with the most substantial records, surviving records. The Kennebec proprietors started a little later in the 1720s and um, 
went about the same time, it closed its books about 1816. Like the Pajeb Scott Proprietor Collection, it dates back to the 1620s and goes um, further, maybe into about the 1830s. So it's the before and the after of uh, the bookkeeping. Like the Pajeb Scott Proprietors, this was about consolidating land grants and previous heirs and bringing those consolidations on about 15 square miles on either side of the Kennebec region. So you're going up the river. There is overlap in some of the area and there's a lot of bitterness. You'll see people who work for one, who work for another, and so the relationships between these. In these collections, you'll also see a lot of social components. You'll see uh, captivity narratives. You'll see Revolutionary War records. You'll see um, uh, church records and municipal records because of the uh, relationships with the communities and really trying to suss out who should be there, who should not be there, and how much do they pay for it to be there and have the privilege of living in Maine. The Kennebec Proprietors Collection is about twice the size of the Pajeb Scott Proprietors. Again, about 90% of the collection is not online. Some of the maps are the ones you'll see here for um, the Northeast uh, in Bath. And then we've got, um, this is uh, another uh, land deed from Richmond Farm in 1751. There's a lot more deeds in the Kennebec records than there are in the Pajeb Scott surviving deeds, I should say. I'll also note that there's a complementary collection for the Pajeb's cut that's at the Peabody Essex. And so you can see the overlap for those. And this is probably one of the more famous maps from the Kennebec proprietors, which happens to be in, in, in uh, our, our recent ex exhibition. So uh, this is the plan of the Eastern Shore, which is essentially about Brunswick up through Phippsburg, or what constituted at that time. And it's known as the Talking Indian Map. As there are two Wabanaki people at the bottom talking about how God is, um, has, has brought the English to, to assist. So it's uh, it definitely a representation of the attitudes that the English had. So these two collections have a really strong relationship to each other. They both arrived at Maine Historical Society in, during the Civil War. Uh, the first was given to Maine Historical Society by a man named Joseph McKean who was a clerk for the town of Brunswick, who was a close friend of Josiah Little, who's really the last of the Pajeb Scott proprietors. The Kennebec proprietor collection was donated by Joseph Williams, who was the son of Rule Williams, who had of statehood fame. And both of those came around the Civil War uh, and were um, processed and made available for research in and around the 1930s through the WPA projects. And a lot of the maps were inventoried at that time. And over time, there's been lots of projects. So as Steve mentioned, uh, Fran Pollitt has worked extensively with these collections, especially the last collection I've mentioned. And there's been a lot of work to prepare them for research, uh, conservation work in the 1990s and again in the 2000s, and uh, some digitization work, some re-digitization work as technology evolves. And then most recently, uh, the work uh, to prepare these collections for uh, this particular grant. So the last of the uh, collections are, is the Barclay collection, which is really, um, it's, it's named for Thomas Barclay, who was a British commissioner from uh, during the, um, the, after the Treaty of Ghent to draw the boundary between the United States and British Canada. Uh, we collectively know it as the Northeast Boundary Collection because really it's an amalgamation of two collections, uh, one related to Barclay and, and his son, uh, Thomas Barclay, uh, who was also a commissioner who uh, filled in for a man named John Ogilvy, who passed away uh, during the, the project. And then also another separate collection from a man named uh, Ward Chipman, which is, this is a piece from that piece. And there's papers and related there to Robert Pig and who were also involved with the drawing of the Northeast Boundary. So this collection is really amazing for multiple reasons. As I mentioned, it, it rarely gets the kind of attention that uh, it deserves uh, as a manuscript collection. And there's a lot of pieces in it that I don't think anyone would expect to find at Maine Historical Society. This is an international collection. It is technically the Canadian collection. These men were uh, on behalf of the British government surveying for the, the, the boundary. And it goes from Maine uh, from Passamaquoddy Bay and going over all the way over to Lake of the Woods in Ontario. So this isn't just about the main border, although a, a lot of the documents are, but this is about drawing the border between here and between essentially Minnesota. 
And these are really hidden at Maine Historical Society. I don't think anyone would, would expect to find the uh, Canadian papers for the drawing of the border at, at Maine Historical, uh, and further to be able to, to find the materials that go all the way over um, you know, to what was constituting the United States at that time. Uh, both of these collections were given to Maine Historical Society in 1894, which was really a kind of a pivotal time for our collecting. We were really in kind of the James Finney Baxter golden era of Maine Historical Society. Lots of publishing, really robust collecting, and it really speaks to um, the quality of our institution in the 1890s. Uh, in the Civil War, also with our ability to collect the proprietors. But in the 1890s was really a time where you see a lot of these signature collections, even if they're a little under the radar, coming to Maine Historical. The Fogg Autograph Collection, which is also one of our gems, but tends to be a much more national and international collection, is also collected in the 1890s. So you, the scope of what MHS was collecting was far more broad at that time than Maine focused, although there obviously is Maine um, provenance and main context, but you see a much more broad uh, collecting strategy at that time. So this collection um, is the largest of all the collections. It's about three times the size of the Pajewska proprietors. There's about 9,000 documents in this collection and a little over 120 maps. This particular map is by Francis Joseph Neptune and uh, it's of the, uh, the Cobscook River in 1798. So there are uh, Wabanaki surveyors and other indigenous surveyors, I believe Seneca surveyors that contribute to this collection. And again, it's really from a British perspective, although there is the juxtaposition of the American records in the collection itself. Uh, I, several years ago, there was a project to item level a lot of the correspondence in our Past Perfect database. So there has been more work on this, but it continues to remain under the radar. Uh, there are wonderful maps in this collection that unfortunately I can't show as part of this slideshow because they're enormous. Uh, some of them are, are solid 13 feet long and uh, we would just not, we just don't have the, the, uh, the technology or the skills to be able to piece those back together in Photoshop. So the fact that Osher is able to photograph these is really meaningful for us to be able to share these with the international research community is gonna be pretty amazing. And this is one of Passamaquoddy Bay. So these are manuscript maps, they are hand-drawn maps. Uh, there's a wonderful atlas that includes the juxtaposition of the American and the British sort of side by side. Uh, the part that's really relevant to Maine is the drawing of the finding the true St. Croix River. That's really the crux of a lot of this collection and finding what really is the St. Croix River, what's the boundary of the St. Croix River and determining what, um, who owns the islands in Passamaquoddy Bay. You'll see a lot of uh, correspondence and uh, relationships to that. The, the last piece that I want to mention about the maps themselves is that it's a lot of documents and it's a lot of materials that will appear online, um, but the maps are really at the center of it. And these are manuscript maps. Uh, while you might be able to find copies of these maps, even other manuscript copies for the Northeast Boundary Collection, the pro proprietor's records, these maps exist nowhere else uh, in the world, uh, uh, unless, of course, there's um, a surrogate copy that was made or sent to Massachusetts. But this collection, as, it, as, these, as they form, can't be found anywhere else. And one of the signature maps, which has been restricted uh, to access for as long as I've been at MHS, is the John North map, which is a map uh, uh, of the Kennebec in 1755. And it is a manuscript map of the settlement. It's about five feet by eight feet is an enormous map and it's in terrible condition. And so this grant is going to allow us to, to conserve that map and to digitize it and make it available. Uh, a, a surrogate was made in the 1920s, but a lot of the names were spelled wrong. So it's not really uh, as useful as it could be. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and we're really able to make this possible because of some work that was done uh, and several years ago by other staff members to really look at our and evaluate our map collection. And we decessioned a, a large portion of maps that were outside of our scope. They were, you know, maps of Hong Kong, maps of Texas, these things that we were collecting during that really broad collecting phase. And we were able to auction those off and reserve those funds for the map collection. And that's um, what we're able to use for the, for the match for this project. So the maps is really at the heart of this, even though it's about 300 plus maps and another 
17,000 documents, the maps is really at the center focal point for, for this piece. So that's really kind of a, an overview of the three collections. The, as I mentioned, they'll appear on main memory and we're developing new tools to be able to present them in a really comprehensive and cohesive way. Transcription's always been a really big part of main memory, but is really prohibitive when it comes to this kind of quantity. So we're undertaking a crowdsourcing a project that's being led by our research librarian, Tiffany Link, who will uh, try to, uh, our goal is about 50% transcription. And if people get excited or at home quarantining, maybe they'll have more time to do more of that. And, uh, and we're working right now, uh, Boston Public Library has some open source software that we're able to collaborate with to, to kind of get this off the ground and to make it widely available to anybody who's interested in participating. So that's essentially the, um, the kind of formal presentation aspect of the project. And I don't know if we want to kind of move into questions or. Jamie, um, you know, it's interesting. I don't know if, if many folks out here have read Alan Taylor's Liberty Men and Great Proprietors of late. It's one of, been, one of my bicentennial activities in, in pandemic activities was kind of going back and I just reread it. And it's, uh, it's fascinating to read what was going on you know, on the frontier, not even uh, including the Wabanaki perspective for a moment, but just the, the kind of cultural and economic clash between the, the, the settlers who had just fought in the revolution and they were looking to, for their piece of land to build lives and you had the, their clash with the proprietors it was fascinating. And it, for me, so much of that resonates with some of the cultural, political dialogue and debate we have today about, you know, class resentment and all. So, Jamie, I'm, I'm curious, you know, a lot of what we talk about at MHS is how all these collections help inform things we um, look at today. You know, what makes, what makes Maine tick today. Are there kind of particular examples or ways that you think uh, these collections really help inform understanding of Maine today and some of our identity and issues we talk about? Well, uh, there's the collections, especially the proprietor's records, I think, uh, demonstrate the, um, the, the, the frontier nature of Maine and sort of the kind of the, uh, for lack of a better word, the Wild West nature of what it meant to live in Maine during this time. And a little bit of the resentment for Massachusetts and its Massachusetts overlords, but also the sort of the complexity of what it means to Maine and, and its natural resources. So you do see a lot of the class struggle in, in these collections some of which comes from the proprietors selling and reselling some of the land, but also you see uh, people who just, it's difficult to really kind of survey and, and to grasp the soap, the scope of that. So really knowing where your land stops and where your land starts was really difficult. So I think it, it, it speaks to, um, you know, how kind of the, the rural nature and, and how much different Maine is even just from Massachusetts and the rest of New England. Well, you see more of that in Northern New England with New Hampshire and Vermont, but Maine is a, is a unique, has a unique sense of place. It has, there's a lot of similarities in the national narrative, but there's a lot of experiences in Maine history that are really unique to Maine. Can you talk uh, just a little, um, one of the interesting things, again, getting back to some of the um, equality issues that are talked about today in the Wabanaki, um, all of a sudden I'm forgetting, her name, um, the, the Lisa Brooks, did some really interesting work in this collection, which brought a whole different uh, Native American perspective to these classic old Yankee collections that was included in Holding Up the Sky. Can you just talk a little bit about how she used uh, MHS collections for her work and found well, different voices in those collections? For the proprietor's collection. So she re-examined the collections in search for two specific characters in her book, uh, our beloved kin and examining the records to kind of find people who aren't overtly mentioned but are still present in the records and understanding the difference between the concept of land ownership and what that means and how Wabanaki communities were with the with the treaties with the deeds were welcoming the communities to cohabitate and not transferring the ownership while the English and just into the into the French to some extent concept of land ownership is different and the cultural clashes with that. And uh, in, in kind of looking at those, I mean, those, those they continue today. It's the cultural, uh, the clashes between the, the main state government and Wabanaki nations and to really, to, to see that 
how people think differently about things and um, and and the colonial settlement that sort of uh, resulted from from those different concepts of land ownership and Thank but lisa's book Lisa's book is really an amazing kind of reimagination and reevaluation of these records which I think that the Barclay collection really has a lot of opportunity with that as well. But the Pajebska proprietors is, as I mentioned, is the, is the most heavily used of the three. But there's been a lot of publications that use these really front and center. Uh, Ian Saxine published uh, another book re very recently called Properties of Empire, which talks about this. As you mentioned, Alan Taylor, there's Gordon Kershaw's book. Uh, there was another book called Speculation Nation, which was published by uh, Michael Blakeman, who's at Yale. So these collections, um, they speak to a lot of topics that are really relevant in current scholarship. Well, we, 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 Jamie and I have been sharing information and talking at you for a little bit. We'd love to kind of unmute everybody and uh, just have answer any questions or just have any conversation about the collection in MHS. Fran, it's so, again, I just want to give another shout out. It's so nice to see you. But the important work that she did on the uh, on the, our main memory network for many years and on this map collection to help MHS get a handle on this huge resource is the critical foundation for this and just really moved MHS forward in really important ways. So thank you, Fran. Yes, thank you, Fran. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any questions? Have other maps you're going to show us today? Oh, un unfortunately I don't because we haven't been able to digitize them until we got this grant. So I, you know, I think would a great opportunity would be that when the grant ends in 2022, that if we reconvened, I would be able to show you all the beautiful maps that have been digitized as part of this because we just haven't been able to do it. They just, they're too big or too fragile. And, um, and I mean, some of them are take up an entire wall. So it's, they're, they're big, <laughs> they're big. And they're all out in the annex where you are? They are not here, but they are up on Congress Street because we're still providing access to them as, as they're requested. Uh, the Pajebska Proprietors is now officially closed while it's being digitized. But once they're digitized, they are moving out here. Yes. Why <laughs> are people access. so interested in the proprietor ones you mentioned? That's well, uh, historians, they, there's a lot of context with colonial um, the colonial history and a lot of really um, interesting components of those. But scholars are interested, genealogists are interested, it's a lot of who's who was where and where they were. So you see a lot of names that you, I mean, if these deeds don't survive, because the courts were in Massachusetts, the people couldn't, either couldn't or didn't want to or didn't have the resources to get down to Massachusetts to file. So sometimes the only way you know that anybody was there was through this. This predates census, it predates the tax registers. So those are really interesting to genealogists. People who are still using these records to, to, um, to determine where their land ends and where it starts. I mean, still really tracing it back because these also predate the, um, the, the, real, the real deed structure when you see it at the traditional sense at the courthouse. So, and then the general public. And there's all kinds of really um, crazy things in these in these collections that are just kind of hidden that you wouldn't expect. Say more about crazy things in the hidden. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said that there's captivity narratives, so there's depositions about people um, being carried away uh, about uh, war. There's materials in there about Father Rawl, who's a really uh, infamous figure uh, or notorious, depending on how you look at it, um, who was uh, murdered. Uh, in the 1730s, I think. So you see a lot of pieces hidden in there. Some Revolutionary War, when you see about land bounties, people being given land uh, in, as, in lieu of payment for their service. So you see a little bit of that. Those are the proprietor's records. For the Barclay collection, um, you know, there's materials in there about the Aroostook War. Uh, the Barclay collection is kind of a strange mix. Is it was added to, so those two collections were kind of morphed into one. And then over time, other Northeast boundary materials were slowly added. And then actually Fran worked on a project to pull some of those back out and kind of separate them so we could understand the provenance. But the relationship with, between Maine and Canada is really fleshed out in there. And there's also some uh, you know, crazy stories, a lot of court cases, a lot of fighting. And court cases always have crazy stories. People are always, I mean, not much has changed, but people drag people into court for all sorts of things. And rarely have a nice thing to say. 
one of the one of the great things in the Barclay collection is there's a lot of the original works by David Thompson, a very very beloved, famous Canadian Canadian uh, surveyor, and those are found nowhere else. And the Canadians love this man to pieces. Many books, many movies, many all kinds of multimedia presentations have been made about David Thompson and his original maps and letters are all part of the Barclay Collection. It's a great resource for Canadian history. It is, it is a really great resource for Canadian history. And what's really fascinating is that the namesake, Thomas Barclay, and both were children, were Americans. They were born in the United States, Barclay from New York and uh, Chipman from Massachusetts. But they were loyalists, and they uh, won, Barclay led loyalist troops. I think Chipman was more of a, um, uh, on, the, on the legal side of it, maybe a little quartermastery. But these were Americans who fled to Nova Scotia and New Brunswick after the war and became involved in politics and had these appointments into these commissions and were dr helping to draw the boundary. So it's, there's a lot of complex history. And, and Main Store, we don't have a lot of loyalist material. I mean, for obvious reasons, people leave and you know, they may or may not have returned, but most of those records reside elsewhere. So for us to have such a, a, a rich collection that um, demonstrates the attitudes and sort of the aftermath of the loyalist um, component to our history is, is also really fascinating. The Barclay Collection, I feel very strongly that when fully discoverable in a way that it will really promote a lot of scholarship, if nothing else in Canada, but this collection is really an amazing collection that flies under the radar. And this is a really great opportunity to be able to, um, to mix it with two collections that don't, that, that are too much on the radar, quite frankly. So it's nice to be able to see the, bring them, bring them together. It's great that we were able to do all three. It's interesting, exciting. You know, we're talking about this vast mass of, mate of, of exceptional material, but it, you know, the parallel conversations of, too of remote engagement and these tools that emerge and will be there on main memory to really highlight and bring pieces of it out and show them in detail and zoom digitally, remotely, in addition to all the physicals is so exciting. I mean, just think about when Jamie and the team are pulling out these crazy stories in these gems, we can feature programs on those individual items alone and go in deep on these families and these locations. And so I think it's just having it all digitized is, uh, it's gonna be such a resource. It's pretty amazing. With each one of the major grants that we've had in the last five or six years, we have uh, used those as an opportunity to create a tool on main memory that brings main memory just a step further. Because it's, it's difficult to maintain, to constantly maintain new technologies and to be fresh and to be innovative. Uh, you know, we, we're already outdated on what we did yesterday. So it's, it's difficult for an organization like MHS to do that. And we really strive to do that. So with the, the, one, the IMLS grant to digitize the early photographs and the glass plate negatives, the tool we really wanted to build was the related images so that people could see what other images were related to that and creating these collections guidelines, uh, a collections uh, guide to the collections in main memory, which is like a collection treatment. And then with the costume exhibit um, grant, which we're sort of in the final stages of right now, the tool is multiple views the beautiful garments to be able to see them from multiple angles in one record. And so we're working with our programmer now to develop code that will allow somebody to see the garment from every angle and not just from the front or from the side so they can really get a, an experience. And then the high resolution digitization of textiles, which was um, also something that was developed, well, introduced to Maine Historical Society as part of that project. So with this last one here, the most current one, it's about presenting those in full context, about presenting bound volumes or collections in a way where somebody can either browse through and just read it like they would at the table, or to be able to uh, contextualize it like we have with some of the earlier collections we put on main memory. I think um, when you look at these series of collections projects over the last couple of decades, I mean, it's remarkable MHS's um, ability to kind of get a handle and really 
de deal and treat and do really important work with kind of cornerstone parts. And, and as Jamie said, you know, there was a CMP collection, there was uh, the maps, the costumes, the photographs, and, you know, as we look into the futures, the paintings will be next. But it's, uh, it's pretty incredible that we the, the work to get a handle and really make this material accessible. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, point out, you know, it's interesting, people see that you get a, a $341,000 grant from NEH and they say, woohoo, they're, they're rolling in it, they're, they're, they're flush. But I, have, I do have to point out that all of that just supports new work and new expense, really important stuff. But, you know, our key challenge is, you know, the fundraising for the core operations, Jamie's expertise and the teams of her team so that we're in a position to kind of do these spectacular projects. So um, just lest you think because of any age's largesse that we didn't have other needs. I think. Right, 50% <laughs> yeah. match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which as I mentioned, the, the, the deaccession project for the maps is really what's supporting, is supporting all of the digitization work that OSHA is undertaking, the conservation of the North map and the digitization of the North map. So we were able to use those resources to support that and, and then to have the staff. We're also really fortunate with the timing of this grant. Uh, as I mentioned, we had applied several times before and um, come right off of the costume grant. We still had a lot of expertise on staff that really excels at digitization and managing these, um, these types of digital files. So that was fortunate that we could just move right into it. it would have been hard to hire that during the pandemic. Comments, questions? Yeah, Jamie, I have a question. This is Rusty. Were there uh, boundary disputes between the Pajepskut and Kennebec proprietors? Oh, yes. Lots. Yes. And those are, are they kind of explained or are you able to research that through these two connections, these two collections rather? Uh, you can, you know, for certain it's, the collections aren't indexed really in it. Well, the Pajepscott has an every name index, but not indexed in a way that would really allow you to see that explicitly on a certain mm -hmm. piece of property, but you do run into it. They were definitely mm -hmm. selling the same piece of land to different people. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes, um, you know, it's hard to say whether it was intentional or it was just a lack of really knowing what the landscape, because a lot of these people from the, the people who were selling this land never came to Maine. You know, they did send surveyors down, but as you saw with that peer poll deposition, you can say that it butts up against this particular island or this particular location. But if you don't really know what the name of that island is, someone can say, well, that's not that island. That over okay. there is that island. So mm -hmm. you do see a lot of, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a lot of overlapping and a lot of infighting, some of which you, is probably intentional and some of which is just um, the difficulty with navigating the landscape. And, and then and when, the narrative too, when you, you, they sure. might not have even had a right to be there to begin with. Mm -hmm. and, and the name Pajepskit, when, when was that applied to describe the Greater Brunswick area? Do you know? I think, I think initially used the Pajepskit. I they, they were incorporated as the, the proprietors of the township of Brunswick. But I don't know when the term Pajepskit was applied to them, but it, it, it must have been somewhat early on because they, um, you, you, see it, you see it commonly used in the records, right. uh, either, or even just the Kennebec records. So uh, they, they weren't initially um, uh, incorporated as that. And the same with the Kennebec proprietors. Their technical name is the, um, is the Plymouth Company. So mm -hmm. the colloquial terms kind of get a little mm -hmm. bit later, but I think relatively early on. Yeah, because Pajepskit, of course, is the name of a little village within the township of Topsom that still exists today. So they, they, they did adopt the name relatively early on, but it is not, it was not their legal name. Their legal name I is see. Riders of the Township of Brunswick. Township of Brunswick, okay. Great. Stunning work. Yeah, it's a really fascinating, it, it's a really fascinating um, mm. project. Thank you guys. Happy, happy beginning of August. We'll see you soon. <laughs>